Today's video is sponsored by Dashlane. Welcome to r slash pro revenge where revenge is a dish best served poisoned. I hope this is the right place for this. So I was getting out of the military and there are two options that service members have for their move when they get out. Either you can rent a U-Haul and throw everything you own into your car and truck and drive home and get reimbursed for the gas, or you can get a moving company that is contracted through the military to move your stuff for you. I was moving a small duplex from California to Colorado, so I opted to have the company move me. I recently underwent major spine surgery and I was in no shape to be moving anything myself as I was still recovering. All of the things were loaded up and I got my delivery date. The delivery date came around and no one showed up. I'd taken the day off from my new civilian job and was upset that I was missing out on work for them to not even contact me about not being able to make the delivery. This was just the beginning of the downward spiral that was to occur. I called the company and they assured me that they would deliver it a week later and gave some BS excuse for not making it. I take off work yet again for them to not show up. I call again and learn that they aren't delivering my stuff because they've lost my paperwork and can't locate my shipment. They literally lost my stuff. Great. I spend the next three weeks trying to get to the bottom of where my things are. I've spent almost two months with an empty condo and I'm getting impatient. But I also understand that if I lose my cool, it's just going to make them not want to work with me, so I keep my cool. After three weeks of basically feeding me BS, they finally found my shipment. Finally! All of the BS is over and I can get my things. Or so I thought. They tell me that the following week they'll make the delivery. I explain the situation to my job and thankfully they were extremely understanding and let me off for a third time to be there when my things were arriving. The day before delivery, it rained all morning long. This will be pertinent later. The following day, I'm sitting around all day waiting for the shipment that's supposed to come midday. They don't arrive until 9 p.m. I could have worked a full day and been home, which annoys me, but hey, at least I'm getting my stuff, finally. They start opening the two large wooden crates with my stuff when they find that one of the crates has severe water damage. Severe! Remember the rain from the day before? Well, in this company's infinite wisdom, they were loading my things up the day before when it was raining and supposedly they ran out of room on the truck just as they got to my stuff. Their solution? Don't bring the crate back into the dry warehouse. Just leave it out in the rain. All morning long. Thankfully, most of our clothes and really important things were in the dry crate that had been left in the warehouse and they weren't destroyed. There was, however, our couch that was completely destroyed by water damage. We ended up just having them take it back with them because we didn't want a nasty, smelly, wet couch in our condo. We make a list of the things that they destroyed with the movers and they gave us instructions to submit a claim. Now, a little bit of backstory on the couch. We bought it used off Craigslist for 150 bucks, and originally we were trying to sell it before the move and weren't able to, so we just kept it. We did take pictures of the couch with a fold-out bid option shown. They had to pay for the full value of the couch, and we eventually found that, brand new, this couch was $2,300 from Crate and Barrel. We were ecstatic because we felt like it was karma for the moving company screwing us over all the time. But it gets even better. The moving company gets our claim and insists that we pick the wrong model because our couch doesn't have a pull-out bid. At this point, they're just trying to avoid paying for the full price and try to get us to take less money. Thankfully, I still had pictures with the bid pulled out to prove that it was indeed the pullout version. Finally, they just accepted that I was right and we agreed on a settlement. A month later, the check came in and wouldn't you know it, the check bounced. Not only was it frustrating, sending a bounced check of over $2,000 or something like that was technically a crime that I could have pressed charges for. At this point, all I cared about was getting my money and never having to deal with this company again, so I didn't want to get into a drawn out legal battle. I called to inform that the check bounced and they assure me that it'll be taken care of soon. A week goes by and I hear nothing, so I call and as soon as they find out it's me on the line, they say they're going to transfer me and then hang up. They do this every time I call for the next two weeks. I send them a written notice requesting payment within 10 days of receiving the notice and still nothing. I'm several months in from all the BS this company has put me through and I'm fed up at this point. So I try an idea my dad gives me. 
I contact my local CBS news station. They have a segment dedicated to helping out people in the community, and they're thrilled to help out a disabled veteran, especially after they hear about the BS that I've gone through. The reporter comes to my house and does a five-minute interview that's aired that Monday night. I cite the fact that these companies are paid for by the government using taxpayer money, and they're screwing over our service members, and that's about it. Nothing really exciting or anything, but it's worked wonders. The next morning, the vice president of the company calls me and makes sure that I get my money wired to my account before the end of the day. Finally, I'm done with these buttholes. But now it gets even better. The military has been notified of the story, and a colonel from the Marine Corps headquarters in the Pentagon calls me the next day, and I explain everything that happened for him. He thanks me for the information and says that he'll be following up with me later. A week later, he calls back and informs me that the company has lost its contract with the military and is undergoing further investigation by the military. So not only did they get terrible publicity from my story being run on CBS, they also lost what I assume had to be a very lucrative contract with the military that was probably paying them well above regular price from what they would originally charge. All in all, it took months of patience in keeping my cool and making sure that I had a solid paper trail of evidence that showed that I had given them every opportunity to do things right and that they had effed me over every time. In the immortal words of Colonel Jessup, You fucked with the wrong Marine! It's 2020 and to be honest, digital security has never been more important. As a YouTuber, I take my digital security super seriously. If someone got my YouTube password, they could just completely take over my channel and do whatever they wanted. That's why I use Dashlane to create and manage passwords. And no, I'm not just saying this because they're my sponsor. I actually do use them every single day. Dashlane can create completely unique and highly secured passwords for each and every website you visit. And best of all, you can install Dashlane on every single one of your devices. If you're the type of person who uses the exact same password for every single website, then you really need Dashlane. All it takes is for one of those companies to have a data breach and suddenly all of your accounts are in danger. You can get Dashlane on your first device by heading to dashlane.com slash r slash. And then to upgrade to premium, use my code r slash. Our next Reddit post is from WTF Jaina. My older sister, let's call her Rhea, and our mom have always had a very difficult relationship ever since I could remember. Rhea has always been headstrong and not afraid to ask questions. My mom was a very traditional devout Christian who put family above everything first. Bit of background, my mom was the second eldest of nine children and moved from the Philippines to the US. She grew up dirt poor in a small province and experienced firsthand the hardship that comes with taking care of a big family. She was the first of her family to graduate college and has always valued education as a means to get out of poverty. She's paid for four of her siblings to go to college. Only two actually completed and went on to find jobs and has also paid for several of her siblings children to go to good schools in the Philippines. Rhea had more exposure to the extended family than I did. She was born in the Philippines, I was born in the US, seven years apart. As she got older, she was very outspoken about how she didn't agree with my mom financially supporting some of her family because Rhea felt as though they were abusing my mom's generosity, especially since mom was frugal with our expenditures here in the US. When Rhea was in her last year of high school, she had a bad falling out with my mom and moved out. They didn't speak for five years, although my dad and I kept in touch with Rhea. In that time, Rhea worked full time and paid her way through college without any help from my parents at all. Fast forward a few years to my high school graduation. I invited Rhea, she attended, and ended up reconciling with my mom. Things were still rocky, but they had a much better relationship. Two years ago, my mom passed away. Unknown to me at the time, Rhea had quietly taken over the continued financial support and cost of living for my mom's youngest sister, Jaina, and maintaining the college fund for Jaina's daughter. She also took care of the funeral arrangements and handling the estate. Dad was a mess at the time. Last year, Rhea and I decided to spend the holidays in the Philippines. One of our visits was to Jaina's place. Little did I know that the poo was about to hit the fan when we sat down for dinner. After small talk, the topic of my mother came up and this was how the conversation went. Details may be lost in translation, so just writing the gist of it. My Aunt Jaina said, Such a shame your mom passed away. We'll miss her. My sister Rhea said, Yes. 
Rhea, why did you stop talking to her? Why did you leave her? You should be ashamed. That's not how you treat family. Now, your mom could have raised you better. You always were too headstrong, you know. That's not ladylike. You shouldn't be so aggressive. You need to be softer. How are you going to get a man otherwise? She goes on to say more stuff along these lines, and Rhea doesn't say anything. Aunt Jaina turns to me. Don't be like your sister, okay? Be a good daughter. Do you have a boyfriend yet? You don't want to get too old like Rhea and not have your own family. That's not following God's plan. Before I could speak, Rhea asked her own questions. Why did you drop out and decide to get pregnant when mom was paying for your college? Did you really think that that businessman would leave his wife and take care of you? If you wanted to be a trophy wife, you should have just said so instead of wasting your mom's hard-earned money. At this point, I just decided to watch because Jaina was starting to piss me off and Rhea had been known to do epic takedowns. My aunt, who was now enraged, How dare you come into my house, eat my food, and disrespect me? Technically, it's my mom's house. You have food because my mom has been supporting you for the better part of 15 years, and you disrespected her by wasting all the opportunities she worked hard to give you. I don't need your attitude or your BS. I don't need anything from you, you disrespectful b****. Get the hell out of my house. Rhea gets up and smiles. You sure you don't need anything from me? You don't want anything from me? I want to confirm that I heard you correctly. I don't need s*** from you. I can take care of myself and my family. And how dare you imply otherwise. Get the hell out of my house and your father will hear about this. Rhea looks at me. You heard her. Let's go. Now, I was surprised by how calmly Rhea was taking the diatribe because I've seen her and my mom get into massive shouting matches. More confused than anything, I followed her to the car. You heard her, right? She doesn't need anything from me. It begins to dawn on me what my sister is about to do. Yeah. Okay. We get back to the hotel and my sister promptly stops the auto transfer of funds for Jaina's account. We then spend the rest of the week lounging by the beach and hanging out with the other cousins. Yesterday, I was talking to one of my cousins and I heard that Jaina is just now realizing what actually happens when you run out of money. I called up Rhea shortly after to give her an update. What? She ran out of money that quick? There was enough in there to last her the year. Oh, did you tell her that? Eh, basic math. Will she lose the house? Nah, it's paid for. As long as she doesn't do something stupid, she should have a roof over her head. Did you also close her kid's college fund? Nope. Not gonna punish the kid for her mom's stupidity. But that's all she gets, so if she F's up, she F's up. So yeah, it'll definitely be interesting how this plays out in the next few months. I have a feeling my sister probably won't give a damn one way or the other though. Our next Reddit post is from Throwaway. This happened a few years back in China at one of the universities there. Here, I was studying Chinese language and I shared my language class with some people from France and Belgium. The French speaking part. Our Chinese teacher was a really nice little lady that happened to also speak French. So often, whenever the French speakers had a question, they would ask it in French. Now, I didn't really mind it all that much, but at some point, it got to the point where about half of the questions in the class were asked in a language I didn't understand. Obviously, that's detrimental to my own learning experience since understanding the questions is important for me to learn the language. So I politely asked them if we could just do the class in English because about half of us didn't understand what was being asked. Lao Shi, the teacher, was very nice about it afterwards and asked the students if they could rephrase the question in English when they asked it in French. But apparently, the French and Belgian girls and guys didn't take it so well. They were constantly glaring at me and whispering among themselves in French. Well, I just shrugged and moved on. However, outside of class, they were always sticking together in their own little group, doing things together. At first, they would just walk past me when I was sitting down having a beer with my friends and they would simply glare. But at some point, it came down to them cursing, talking smack about me to the other students, and spitting on my lap when I was sitting in the park. Obviously, I was seething, so I might have called them a few words which were a bit too unsavory. Anyhow, they didn't take it well. On the next day, I found out that they had scribbled all sorts of things on my dorm room. It basically said, F your mother. 
as well as the name of a certain German political party that was popular in the 1940s that I won't say the name of on YouTube. I don't actually know why they put that one. I think they thought I was German, which I'm not. Obviously, I was pissed, but I didn't really know what to do, so I reported it to the International Student Office. The office was really nice and understanding, but told me they can't actually do much unless I provide proof that something is happening. Thus, I went on Taobao and bought a little recording camera. Looked a bit like a dash cam. It had the time and date and everything. After the university had painted my room door over, they couldn't get the markers off apparently. I hung the camera up in a corner of our dorm corridor and pointed it at my door. Then I left and made sure to loop around a little bit to walk past the group of French and Belgians so that they knew I was leaving campus towards the metro station. I had some nice dumpling soup and a beer, and when I came back, lo and behold, once again, they were hardly creative with their insults, just more the same. But this time, I had proof. I checked the video, and I was very pleased. Five out of the seven of the group were actually there and all wrote something on the door with permanent marker. One of the guys even kicked the door, which caused a crack at the bottom. These doors weren't very sturdy. They seemed to have a lot of fun doing it. Now, of course, the school was properly pissed when I showed them the video. Normally, the students would just get a stern warning, but because the International Students Office was aware that they were doing it before, and also about the fact that they were harassing me all the time, I reported everything to them when it happened. They were less than understanding this time, and suggested that the board expel the students. And so they were. All of this took place over the course of a couple of months, so we were nearing the end of the semester. The five students who scribbled at my door got expelled just before their exams, which meant that all the time they spent at the university was effectively worthless since they didn't receive any credits for it. But it gets even better. After this whole ordeal, I sent a neat anonymous letter in Chinese, one of my Chinese friends helped me write it, to the Public Security Bureau that these students had engaged in vandalism at our university. A few weeks later, after I'd returned home, I was told by a friend of mine who was on good terms with their group that some of them had booked tickets and hostels to travel in China at the end of the semester. However, their visa extension was denied by the Public Security Bureau on the basis of their misdemeanor at the university. I'm not sure if the second part was caused because of my letter or simply because of the university informed the police, but I like to pretend that it was the former. So I was just laughing my butt off as they slaved away half a year in courses for which they received no credit and had to cancel thousands of dollars worth of travel plans. That truly was a sweet, sweet feeling. That was r slash pro revenge and if you like this video then let me know by hitting that like button because it really helps my channel grow.